Hi, this is Bob Scully and welcome to another edition of The World Show, Entrepreneurs, The Dobson Series. Our guest this week has won Entrepreneur of the Year twice. You don't see that very often. And he's known as the Mr. Fixit of the venture capital world and that he certainly is. He can take your company when it's in the ditch about to sink out of sight irretrievably into the mud and pull it out. He'll fly off the cliff and sail under your company before it crashes on the rocks below. He can work all kinds of magic on very troubled organizations, diagnosis, execution, repair, and bringing them back to health. He's known far and wide around the world for that kind of very rare talent. And yet, despite all that, he has steadfastly refused to take advantage of financial engineering and all its lucrative derivatives. He doesn't touch that kind of thing. It holds no interest for him. His values are strong. And those very same values have led him to start with his wife, a foundation built around hidden angels. I won't say any more about that. Let's let Bud Kirshner tell the story himself. Here he is. Bud Kirshner, uh, winning Entrepreneur of the Year is a big deal. You, you can wear it as a badge of honor for years and years. It's like winning Wimbledon. Uh, <laughs> but generally, unlike Wimbledon, you win it once. And you are the Bjorn Borg of this thing, because, uh, or, the, or the Roger Federer, because you've won it twice in a row. Let's talk about that. How, how did that happen? Well, it was quite a while ago now, but um, what I do remember about it is that it really each of the awards recognized one of the two things that are most important to me in business. The first was for uh, building a world-class company. The second was for fixing a world-class company. And the reality is those are the two aspects of business that I've devoted my career to. So to have a recognition related to each of them was pretty important to me. And Bjorn Borg went for five. You're not, you're, are you thinking of that? <laughs> no, I'm closer to hand, uh, retiring than I am to going for number five. And you're known as the, uh, you say fix, and you're known, <clears throat> I saw in the research, the Mr. Fixit of the venture capital world. You will take a mess and try to deliver it back to its shareholders or new shareholders in mm -hmm. working shape. Uh, it's called a workout, uh, usually. It's very different from hedge funds or just venture capitalists who just want to sell out when something grows. Right. It's kind of messy, isn't it? It's hard. Well, it's hard, but the reality is that I learned those skills by helping to build companies from the grassroots up. And so once you know what makes a good company, <clears throat> it's relatively straightforward to put it back on track once it gets off track. So we have a fairly disciplined approach, and we go into these situations. Um, it's a kind of work that's in fairly high demand because almost every company goes off track at some point. We tend to think of it as a stigma, but the reality is for small and medium enterprise, if you're working as aggressively as you can to build something from nothing, inevitably you are going to go off track. Uh, it's part of the process. And so we're pretty proud of the fact that we've got a reputation of being able to put those companies back on track uh, and taking them into another success story. Back to the Entrepreneur of the Year Award, mm -hmm. uh, the company there that I fixed, we actually went on to, at the same time we were fixing that company, uh, 100 competitors went bankrupt, uh, and when we finished, for the next five years, we were in the top five companies in the country for um, revenue and shareholder um, uh, value creation. That's, that, that, is a, that the others went bankrupt tells you it was a troubled sector yes, right there. that's right. What, what sector was it? Uh, that sector was aquaculture. Aquaculture, mm -hmm. in, in, other, in other words, in, in uh, like, like uh, hydroponic and... Well, it's um, <clears throat> aquaculture in the general sense is growing fish under intensive oh, fish. culture. It okay. yeah. um, can be shellfish, it can be finfish. Uh, we started, the bankrupt company we started with was a finfish company. Uh, when we finished, we were in several different species and we had done acquisitions around the world. So you inject capital, you don't <clears> just you don't just fix, you really have to bring in new parts and new equipment in a sense, uh, meaning capital. Well, if you think about making a company successful, it's a little bit like a barrel with one stave is inevitably shorter than the others, and that's where the water runs out. So to fix a company, you start with fixing that first stave, and that might be the need for capital, it might be the need for more disciplined management, it might be the need for a more aggressive marketing campaign, access to international markets. So the fixing of the company is all about first things first, dealing with the first stave that's short, then another one becomes short, and eventually you've built a successful company. 
And you're a little bit, I guess, like the doctor on the <clears throat> battlefield doing triage. You, you, you're solicited a lot. You have to decide if it's fixable, uh, and that's a tough decision. How, how do you make that? Is it gut feel or analysis? You come in and say, no, I'm not going to touch that one. I can't do it. This one I can do. How do you make that determination? Well, I think probably on the back of a 40-year career, there's a lot of pattern recognition. I can look at a company. I can get a pretty good sense of whether there's the right ingredients there and they've just been sort of deployed inappropriately or whether or not it's a flawed business model or the fundamental issue is, is there a value proposition that the market actually needs? And so if, <coughs> how important are people there, the quality, because I notice in the research it comes back a lot, um, but flawed business model can be the market. Mm -hmm. um, does it happen that you have great people in a lousy business model and you have to turn them down? Well, if you have great people, um, I'd be inclined to take on great people no matter what the business model because really it's always about business. Uh, analogous to the real estate saying about location, location, location. Mm -hmm. Small and medium enterprises about people, people, people. And when you come in, uh, do you come <clears throat> in with a team that will sit there and sort of run it for a few months? Is there, a, do you have a pattern there, a method? Well, if, if we're dealing with a, what we would call a distressed or a company that's off track, the first thing we'll do is essentially an assessment. We'll determine what things are not working and which things are not working. We'll determine what the potential is for the company in the marketplace. We then formulate a plan. We build a plan that we think is, addresses all the needs of the company and dovetails better with the marketplace. Then we'll assemble a team amongst our people uh, to go into the company. Um, and then as quickly as we can, we will phase out of that company and bring in more permanent management. because. Again, like an emergency room doctor, we're at our best in those acute situations when we're in a distress situation. When we're helping to build a company from the grassroots up, mm -hmm. then we take a completely different approach, but the priorities remain the same. And as I read uh, a lot of the things you've done, I kept thinking of, this is a different uh, uh, story altogether, but Buffett has often made a lot of money on obscure little companies that he's taken care of, Seize Candy and uh, the Furniture Mart in Omaha uh, with that lovely old lady who died at 90. And, uh, but he kept them. Yep. He, he kind of fell in love with them, yep. but they were good, and, they, and he worked hard at them. Yep. Um, do you ever fall in love enough that you, you keep it in your portfolio? Well, we would inevitably keep an ownership interest. It's just our management team would tend to move on and put in a more permanent management team. So for sure, if we put a company back on its feet, by then we know it so well, uh, we've become so personally involved in its success that we would always maintain an interest, an economic interest in that company. But would you own 100% of it? <clears throat> Rarely would we own 100% of any company because we're a small group and it's important to be somewhat diversified. So. Generally, our ownership interest in our asset management business, for example, would be somewhere between 10 and 50 percent. And you're not, the, in, in venture capital, there's always this kind of, uh, uh, this be all and end all, which is the exit strategy mm -hmm. where they're going to make a pile. Right. And people are always looking at the clocks and when's our exit strategy. But that's usually with companies that they want to take public and so on. Right. Um, I don't think this process is like that. Well, there's always an exit component because companies inevitably need someone to be able to move on. It could be someone wants to retire. It could be an estate that needs to be settled. Companies rarely go on generation after generation with the same ownership. There's usually some transition. We've actually, one of the groups that we have within our group, our overall group, is dedicated to helping companies do these kind of transactions, to transition from one owner to another. Mm -hmm. Not because we're hell-bent to get out of deals, but because we recognize that uh, ownership interest changes, people's priorities change, people get older, um, situations change. And um, how does it work concretely with the phone on your <clears throat> desk? It's, it's like calling the doctor, right? Help, <laughs> help, I need help. Uh, when can you yeah. come over? How does it happen? People get your name, yeah. and they call you and say, uh, Mr. Kirshner, I'm in trouble here. Yeah. Uh, what can you do? Is that, that the way it? Yeah, I, I, I'll, give you a quick, I'll give you a quick example. So not too long ago, I had a phone call, just as you described, and it was from a group with a company uh, in California, but with operations in Australia and Europe and several other countries. Um, said that they had their instincts were things were not going as well as they should. These are the investors in the company. So asked if we would first just go and take a look see. So we literally got on a plane, went to London, spent three 20 hour days assessing the core of the operations, came back, reported to those shareholders some 55 issues that we had identified that seemed to not be as good as we thought they should be. Uh, and from there, the process that I described earlier, we went in, built the plan, and restructured the company. 
And you seem to be the opposite. <clears throat> you earn your keep and you earn that profit, that plus value. Uh, how do you feel, though, about these hedge funds? i got to ask you this. Uh, <laughs> parasitic hedge funds, we, we've seen, you know, they fool around with the paper. Yeah. Couldn't care less about the company. As right. a matter of fact, if it goes down, they'll short it. Yep. Um, do you, since they are in a parallel business, yep. do you feel uh, uh, some kind of, what, what's your feeling about them? Well, many years ago when I started in this business, I spent a lot of time contrasting what we do to what I would call financial engineering. That there are very smart people, very able to manipulate balance sheets, to play with inventory, to make companies look like they're better than they really are. Or there's their ability to use leverage to generate a higher return on assets. My approach and my orientation and our group's approach is really about fundamental value. What makes a good company good? How do you make it great? And how do you fix it when it's broken? It's not about how do you make it look better than it maybe is. And I, I, I would not want to miss a second topic that's very important, which is your social entrepreneurship, to which you devote a lot of time as well. It's the Hidden Angel Foundation. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that. What is that? Well, the Hidden Angel Foundation is, as you say, my, my effort at social entrepreneurism. Um, my wife and I had a son who had a congenital problem that it prevented him from being able to interact with the world around him. We discovered that when he was exposed to situations that would stimulate his senses, that his world lit up, that his life became enriched. And so when he passed away, we decided to start a foundation devoted to something called multi-sensory environments. And in his name, we would make these available to children throughout North America. And the, um, can we put a name on, on the, what illness was it? Then? Uh, his condition was called San Filippo syndrome. I see, and, and, but multisensory MSEs mm -hmm. can help, I'm told, all, all Alzheimer's patients, elderly patients, all kinds of autistic children. Uh, it, well, how does it work? Think, it, well, if you think about, well, I mean, imagine this. Uh, you typically would touch 300 surfaces every 30 minutes. We all would. We, inside, underneath our skin, we have miles of nerve endings. We have pressure sensors. We have cold sensors. We have all sorts of different apparatus that releases neurotransmitters, releases hormones. This is how we know we're alive. This is what lights up our day. Now imagine the world for a child or a senior citizen who are unable to interact with the world around them. Imagine how that must feel. So they tend to develop conditions where they fail to thrive, where they withdraw, because their life is not enriched. So the concept of multisensory environments is very simple. We develop facilities, generally inside of hospitals or schools or therape therapeutic clinics, where these children or senior citizens, in the case of Alzheimer patients, uh, are able to go in and by accessing this equipment, they not only can interact with their environment, but they can actually influence their environment, which gives them a completely different perspective on the world around them. And although I don't know how, exactly how it works, I was struck by, by some of the descriptions. It gave me the impression it was a good idea that nobody had stumbled upon before. Some of these things are quite simple, like a mirror ball. Exactly. They're, I mean, yeah. they're, not, they're not nuclear science here. Uh, but, but how was this? How, how did they happen upon these solutions? Well, in fact, the whole tech, the techniques were originated in Europe in the 1970s. Um, they, for some reason, they never really made it to North America. When we were dealing with our son, we started with a more fundamental approach to sensory stimulation. We would take him in the fresh air. We would spend a lot of time uh, exposing him to music. We would take him to a mall, which is the ultimate multi-sensory experience. Yeah. Um, in the course of doing that and reading about sensory stimulation, we discovered what in Europe are called snoozeland facilities. And mm. snoozeland is the word that they use in Europe for these facilities. There, for decades, they've been using the, the, this equipment to deal with uh, children with autism, all sorts of neurological conditions, physical impairments, and they've discovered that the children uh, learn better, are more relaxed. I mean, the reality is, as we all know, when you're happy, you're healthy, mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to achieve. And uh, I, I don't know if I read correctly, your son was expected to not go beyond <clears throat> the age of 12, and he actually doubled that. He, That's correct. He, and you, you would attribute that to these efforts? We think, we know, we could see every day in his eyes that he is, that this equipment motivated him, and we believe it enriched his life and ultimately extended his life, correct? And um, the, the grandmother, who never knew him, plays a role here. I, I, again, I hope I read correctly. It's in memory of why? Um, <clears throat> well, the grandmother is my, my wife's mother, and she passed away when my wife was very young. 
by all accounts, she had many of the same gifts that Christopher had. She was a very courageous person. She was a very loving person. And so we thought that there was a certain thread that was continuing from her to Christopher. Christopher was, as we would describe him, the ultimate hidden angel in mm. that he was able to make a lot of things happen uh, despite his infirmities. And so is she then the hidden angel? She was also a hidden angel. And um, do you spend, you, you, I know that you, you spend um, resources, money to, to endow hospitals <coughs> with a particular facility like mm -hmm. that, um, but in Birmingham or, or uh, whenever you are in a city that has one, do you visit, do you spend time with oh, the kids? Oh, absolutely, and, absolutely. I mean, the highlight of my week is each, when, the, when we open the mail from the different facilities and we hear these anecdotes from about children who uh, were unable to show emotion before and now are smiling and giggling. Uh, we read about children who are having difficulty learning uh, and now because they're so relaxed, they're in a non-threatening environment, they're able to learn. Um, the, the anecdotes go on and on and on about the impact that these rooms have on people at the most fundamental level simply enriching their life, mm -hmm. but as I said in some cases encouraging children with autism to say their first words, uh, encouraging other children to interact with the world around them when they won't previously. And I would imagine in some cases, if the problem is not biological, not physiological, but, but uh, psychological, you might actually s turn their life around completely, the way you turn around a company. It, you know, if, if, if there's nothing wrong, quote unquote, with the brain, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's some kind of, of autism that developed some other right. way, you could turn that around. Well, I, I don't know if I'd want to say we could work miracles, um, but the reality is that the, we're learning more every day about the brain's ability to adjust and to adapt. We now talk about brain plasticity. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear about people with strokes recovering. We hear about children with neurological problems developing supplementary skills. So uh, again, I wouldn't want to create false expectations about what these rooms would do, but the point is that when, a, when an individual is able to have uh, the neurons, the neural system firing and feeling normal about the world around them, it opens up scope to learn, to be healthy, to be happy, and these things all sort of lead to the brain's ability to start to adjust and adopt. But I would assume also, uh, and this might be amusing to watch, that given your, your lengthy managerial experience with competence and incompetence, yeah. you walk into a snoozling room that you've endowed halfway around the world, you know if they're on the ball or not. Do you feel like cleaning some of them up? Or? It, it, it's a very good point. And, and the reality is that as we talk about pattern recognition in business, we have the same thing in social entrepreneurism. And there the key factor is simply empathy. That if there is a room where the caregivers, the enablers as we call them, are empathetic, it will be making a world of difference. The reality is if we'd all learn to be more empathetic with these individuals who have special needs, mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't have to occur in a room. It can happen every day. So endowing the facility is one thing, but I guess recruitment, we'd call it in business terms, is key here. Recruitment is key, as is evangelical effort. A, a lot of our time on behalf of the foundation is simply spent trying to convey the message that individuals with special needs are first and foremost entitled to be happy and enriched just like the rest of us. But secondly, from a somewhat selfish point of view, they have tremendous gifts to give us. They can teach us about courage. They can teach us the meaning of love. They can teach us about the importance of simple things in life. So a lot of the time, a lot of our time is spent simply trying to convey that message. The rooms are just one vehicle to help deploy that. And I guess the phone rings, the word gets around, it's the same as the companies. They say, let's call Mr. Kirshner. We want, we want a room like this. Is yes. that how it works? Hospitals call you? Yeah, hospital. I mean, again, I can give you a quick example. Not too long ago, we had a call from a school board, had a school with 250 children with special needs uh, and a budget that they were unable to do anything special for these children. They were just exposed to conventional programs. So we went, we met the children, we talked to the teachers. Um, got a sense of what the what we would call sensory diet would have been for the children. We recognized that there was at least two different s situations. Some children were completely uh, unable to get around except with assistance. Others were more mobile but still had infirmities. Mm -hmm. And so we actually there donated two different rooms, one designed for the children with much restricted limitations and the other uh, for the other children. So that's, that's kind of how the process works. 
And I'm struck when you say uh, we went and checked it out. The, that's that, and you'd do that with a company too. You'd go and check it out. And I remember reading, I think it was a biography of Benjamin Graham, who was that legendary investor in, at Columbia. Warren Buffett's teacher. That's yes. right. And in the 20s, he would do that. He would go visit companies, right. and all of Wall Street would just laugh at him and say, "What are you doing, wasting your time? Right. Look at the numbers and and do your money stuff, right. and that's it." But and nowadays, though, it has become <coughs> uh, uh, practically a truism. You can't get anything good done in business or in social entrepreneurship unless you're hands-on and really put your nose in it. Well, I think the reason I travel 270 to 300 days a year is the fact that I believe that very firmly, that uh, I could just simply sit at my desk and answer the phone calls, as you mm -hmm. suggest. But the reality is that I need to understand what the situation is. I have to rely on my instincts. Uh, I've spent a long time trying to sharpen my skills as an entrepreneur. So whether it's in a business setting or a social setting, I like to try to deploy them from the grassroots up. And did your son, um, who's now the hidden angel, but as he as he was growing up, see all of this unfolding and, in a sense, realize it was he was giving his life so that this could be done for others? How, we, how? We, we believe that that was the case. He was unable to communicate in a conventional manner, but the reality is that we believe very firmly that this was this is his mission, not ours. And the parents of these children, when you I assume you meet them too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are they, uh, because that's not a problem that is easily addressed, uh, and certainly not by health systems that want pathology with cures and drugs and Correct. so on, uh, they must be quite grateful when you... Well, I think they're grateful. I think, I think that they're, in a sense, relieved that really it's such a simple thing to help their children. That, I mean, the reality is the ultimate sensory experience is a hug. And sometimes you just have to remind people that as difficult it may be to deal with someone with special needs, um, you can enrich their life through the most simple gesture. And that goes back to the lessons I said that these individuals can teach us. And to go back to business a little bit, I think people by now realize you're a person who's capable of great hope and great optimism, but no fool. You're very realistic <laughs> and, and hands-on. Um, so get us out of this recession. Uh, what, what, do you, what, what would you suggest? I mean, small and medium-sized companies are the motor of That's almost right. every economy. What would That's you right. suggest? Well, I think, as you say, that really we need to start to focus on what we would call small and medium enterprise mid-market companies. It is the engine of the economy, it's where the most jobs are created, and the reality is it's where the great ideas are being born. So what we need to do is go back to the fundamentals. We need to start looking for good ideas, we need to look for very committed, intelligent people, and we have to provide them with the resources to succeed. I like to think one of those resources is the Kirchner Private Capital Group, where mm -hmm. we can provide those people with the been there, done that expertise that they need throughout the various stages of what they're doing, whether it's turning an idea into a business, uh, buying another company, creating an exit for themselves. This is what we do, and it's designed to help build these companies good times and bad times. And you, you travel all over the world. You deal with companies from all over the world. Uh, Mr. Friedman in the New York Times keeps banging on this nail saying the U.S., and you could include Canada in that, have had it easy for so long. Uh, that we, you know, we, we're not worried about innovation anymore, we're not worried about hard work, we somehow think it's all going to come our way. Meanwhile, these other countries, India and so on, are busy, busy, busy. Is mm -hmm. that your impression? Um, I think it's an oversimplification, but I think for sure we have been lured into a sense of, uh, a false sense of security. Um, innovation, tenacity, sacrifice, these are the things that build great economies. I think other countries are at a stage in their development where that's perhaps uh, more the rule than the exception, but I would never underestimate the North American entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and I believe that, as I said earlier, with the right kind of resources, um, uh, you will see a lot of great innovation coming out of North America. And would you also say that the cold shower on <clears throat> Wall Street didn't last long? They didn't get punished very much. That's a feeling that's out there, yeah. and they're back to partying. That's not very reassuring. Yeah. Well, what's your take on it? I, I, I mean, I think, unfortunately, that appears to be true. I think that uh, one would have hoped such a sobering experience would have carried a lifelong lesson for people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that happened. But again, a lot of what goes on in Wall Street is not about small and medium enterprise. Small and medium enterprise is closer to Main Street than Wall Street. So I think these are the companies that uh, it's a much smaller transition back to the fundamentals. And I hope that more and more opportunities will present itself for these companies to see that, see that mission as opposed to 
the delusions of grandeur that is sometimes Wall Street. And uh, Bud Kirshner, to end, um, I know some people will have picked up on the Hidden Angel Foundation. Do you have a website? Do you have where should they? We do. If people would be kind enough to go to C D H A F Christopher Douglas Hidden Angel Foundation dot org. They will find out. They will find out. Okay, and I'm sure many of them will. Thank you so much. Long Thank life you. to you and to the foundation. Thank you very much. Bud Kirshner. And here's that web address again for the Hidden Angels Foundation. This has been Entrepreneurs, the Dobson Series of the World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. I'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.